Will Fling. Milos Forman arrives, behaving towards the three roommates like some lecherous uncle. Michael Emil drifts in, announcing himself as a psychosexologist who has to sleep with his women patients before he can treat them. But what all the visitors do is talk, revealing their deepest problems in a spate of self-conscious and pretentious agonizing that's mostly answered with equally self-conscious and pretentious philosophizing. Little white dove is flying and she meets God's little angel. And the angel asks, where are you going, human soul? And the soul says, I'm trying to reach heaven. I'm trying to reach heaven. Mm. Heaven? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I never told you the English word? No. Your father, whatever you say at this point in her life, she's going to resist. Let her learn it. I mean, if it's that bad, she'll find out. I'll find out everyone's too late, Jimmy. Like, go into combat and die, and then we'll be such You went there. Yeah, I hated yeah. it. You had the experience. Oh, God. There's not going to be anybody like you in California. No. Come on. Come on. When I get in some tiny apartment, some girl in gym shorts is going to live in the village. She's like, oh, hi. Um, oh, you need something? Oh, what can I get you? Oh, really? I don't think we have that here. I think they don't even sell it in L.A. The brain cells die the minute you hit LAX. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. I'm serious. It's not a place That's for her. A She's a young, vital person. Who made these spots all over the walls? Not me, not me. They moved all that furniture in and everything. Well, it... Oh. I'm going to miss you so much. This really hurts. Me too. Listen, the reason I feel I can talk to you about this, you're a little more mature than the other girls, and uh, frankly, uh, I'm attracted to you. <laughs> Does that bother you if I say that? No. Absolutely. But because I always have been, you know. Now, a little of this is very amusing, but equally, a little of it goes a very long way. After a bit, you find yourself sitting there like some captive, unpaid shrink, condemned to listen with no remission of sentence for good behaviour to the interminable intellectual and emotional whinging of people who have no real problems at all. Next week, in the last regular programme of the series, I'll be looking at some of the films on offer over the holiday period. Films like V.I. Warshawski with Kathleen Turner as a private eye in Chicago, Suburban Commando featuring the ex-wrestler Hulk Hogan, and Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey with Keanu Reeves. In addition, Jodie Foster talks about Little Man Tate, on which she made her debut as a director. Liverpool's uh, task here, Trevor Brooking. Liverpool versus Swarovski Tyrol, live, and a chance to see what they can do on their own territory. At Anfield for the second leg of the UEFA Cup third round and fresh from their success at Innsbruck. Will Dean Saunders up his total of six goals in two matches, or can Tyrol fight back to regain their form? Liverpool versus Swarovski Tyrol, tomorrow at seven on one. In 25 minutes on one, we have a news update on the latest developments from the European summit at Maastricht. First, though, we turn the cameras around for a look at the action, special effects and wizardry that was used during the making of Terminator 2. We did it, Kyle. We got it. In 1984, film audiences were introduced to a new kind of villain. Seven years later, writer-director James Cameron has re-teamed with stars Arnold Schwarzenegger and Linda Hamilton for the long-awaited sequel, Terminator 2, Judgment Day. These little children today, all grown-ups, the one line that everyone always asks me to say is, you know, say, I'll be back, say that line, come on now. Are you going to be back or what? <laughs> Cybernetic organism. Cybernetic systems model 101.
I'll be back. Those words took on new meaning in the fall of 1990 when cast and crew reunited in the Mojave Desert to continue the story of Sarah Connor and her fight against the machines of the future. The important element that's changed in her life since we saw her last is that she's had her son, John Connor, and he's now 10 years old. The new Terminator of the film is not targeted on her anymore. The child now himself is the target. Okay. For Cameron, Terminator 2 was only a matter of time. Action! It was inevitable that a Terminator sequel would get made, and I wanted to be at the helm. I wanted to make sure it didn't kind of drift off the concept of what it should be about. Cameron's vision of a killer cyborg from the future hit a chord with audiences worldwide. The Terminator represented something to people, a kind of a, a dark side of the human psyche. People want to uh, have that fantasy of being able to do exactly what they wanted to do whenever they wanted to do it. I need your clothes, your boots, and your motorcycle. <laughs> He forgot to say please. It took us all, I think, a while to realize that the Terminator had kind of permeated into the culture, and it just kept getting reflected back to me in so many ways. Arnold Schwarzenegger, the Terminator. Arnold was always a very strong force in trying to get the sequel made. I said to Jim Cameron, I said, you know, we should have an ongoing story because we're dealing here with such an interesting subject. I knew. Instinct told me that based on the, the strength of the first film, that there would be another one. Um, it's just, you, you're never ready. <laughs> Several of the original Terminator crew returned for the sequel, including director of photography Adam Greenberg and Terminator effects creator Stan Winston. A uh, sequel must be true to the first film, but yet it must be more than the first film. We have to give them what they got in the first, and we have to give them something new and fresh. And I think that's what we've done in Terminator 2. How can Arnold be starring in the sequel? A Terminator is built in a factory, and there's one after another after another, and they all look like Arnold. I guess it's just because he's cute. This Terminator, however, isn't just another pretty face. There's more sophistication to the, the, the way it will look, and bigger, much bigger uh, things will happen on the screen. For six months, Terminator 2 combined the efforts of over a thousand filmmakers shooting day and night throughout the state of California to capture the many action sequences of the script. The production actually changed the course of a river to shoot high-speed chases in the extensive flood control channels of Los Angeles. Roll, guys, roll. The tight quarters and massive filming equipment often paralleled the action of the scenes being shot. A defunct steel mill was resurrected by the filmmakers, recreating the intense heat and light of molten steel. Ironically, actual temperatures in the mill averaged 42 degrees, making it difficult for the actors to work up a sweat. And in Northern California, a team of expert pyrotechnicians staged one of the largest police shootouts in cinematic history. Their crowning achievement, however, was blowing up a four-story office building. Were we supposed to roll? <laughs> that was a rehearsal. I'm waiting for your cue, Jim. <laughs> Arnold and I working together, it's, it's just like it was on the first picture. He's one of the most professional people I've ever worked with. He has incredible concentration. He takes physical direction like no actor I've ever worked with. And it's really a joy to work with him. Yeah, exactly. It's really it's part of the shoot. It was before my method acting uh, seminar. <laughs> Although then, in 1984, he paid a lot of attention to 
the acting, he pays much more attention to the acting now. The way he goes about directing actors, how much time he spends with rehearsals, how much time he spends with perfection and with moves and gestures. I think you both go. Thank you. <coughs> Freeze. So I would say that in that area, he's much smarter and much more sophisticated. I mean, he wants to do basically everything because he has such a clear vision of what he wants to see and see him ending up running with the smoke machine and creating smoke in front of the camera and then putting on blood and doing, trying to do your makeup. That's why people always say that a Jim Cameron movie has a certain look because it's a total representation of what he wants to see. Long before the cameras roll, Cameron and crew are hard at work designing sequences and testing ideas in a unique mix of filmmaking and science. I do a lot of uh, visual research, I do a lot of technical research. The more fantastic the subject, the more realistic the, the situation needs to be. Using extremely detailed models, Cameron designs sequences with the aid of a thumb-sized video camera. By blocking the scene in miniature, production designer Joe Nemec can alter a location or set to meet the specific needs of the scene. Also during pre-production, an ex-Israeli commando provided the cast with military combat and weapons training. Since the character of Sarah has become an expert marksman, Linda was required to master a variety of guns and assault rifles. It was really like entering the military and learning the mindset and um, coming up against myself in a big way. That was even more significant in terms of playing Sarah. Very good. She has so set herself down a path, a concentrated path of, of duty, that she's lost all touch with her son. You cannot risk yourself even for me. Do you understand? You're too important. She's a great warrior, but for what? You know, so what? She doesn't have anything that makes it worth while you know and also my life <laughs> it's like no, we don't even we don't even notice the gunshot anymore why does it want me it was a nuclear war sarah has lived with this the certain knowledge of the destruction of the world on a certain date for so long that it haunts her dreams and nightmares every night and it's driven her kind of to the point of madness, really, as it would anybody who really had to confront that knowledge. Because I knew it happened! It happened! We experience the end of the world through Sarah's eyes, a process that called for the strictest sense of realism. But even more powerful and haunting, are Sarah's visions up. of the people. And he comes down, and actually he jumps off and covers up. Ho oh, ho, stop. <laughs> What'd you do? See Commando ten times? <laughs> when we had to create ashen bodies that were going to be blown away by a nuclear holocaust, it was very unsettling. <laughs> and it was the one time when you got a little uncomfortable because it wasn't pleasant to look at while you were shooting it. But it is the important aspect of the film. Judgment Day, the day Sarah was told the war would start, clearing the path for humanity's successor, the machines. Future War, for Terminator 2, Cameron mobilized an army of actors, stunt people, and special effects crews to create the final battle between humanity and the machines. This battle took place on many levels in Terminator 2, as the crew executed one successful vehicle stunt after another. That is a cut! That is a cut! One scene required the Terminator to climb from a speeding pickup onto a heavy tanker, a feat performed by Arnold's stunt double, Peter Kent. After a successful spin-out, the truck was rolled onto its side and dragged by a team of tractors. Peter rode the sliding tanker like a surfboard. To protect young John Connor, 
the human resistance has sent the Terminator itself. My mission is to protect you. Who sent you? You did. Oh, this is deep. Playing the role of young John Connor is newcomer Eddie Furlong. It's almost, in a way, the classic, the classic story. I mean, he literally was just plucked off the streets of Pasadena and uh, whipped into the vortex of, uh, of making a movie. And Jim said, Eddie, I was going to tell you Friday, but don't tell anybody. But we're gonna, we picked you for this film. And I, I felt like hugging Jim, but he's a guy, so I didn't hug him. Cast with less than a month before production, Eddie began an intense period of preparation. In addition to his regular education, he received physical training, acting lessons, and motorcycle classes. Funny thing is, I'm sure it's nothing like anything he ever expected, and it's a total left turn in his life. But on the other hand, children have this remarkable capacity to just deal with things, whatever life throws them. They don't know how the world is supposed to be yet, so they just think that's, that's okay. You know, it can be like this if it wants to be. One of the many tasks Stan Winston and crew undertook was enhancing the original Terminator makeup design. Originally, there were a, a number of stages designed or considered as Arnold stages in makeups for this particular production. An actor must know going into a situation like this that there is physical stress with this process. Fortunately, Arnold Schwarzenegger is a, is a pro. Three more hours of this. I don't know how much longer I can take this. He attacks it as a pro. He doesn't complain. All right. But I need my foot massages, my oatmeal, my Austrian Christmas music. I need it all. Go ahead. Do it. This pre-made up piece here is going to be glued to Arnold's face with the help of Arnold holding it. Hold on a second. Okay, now, it's the glue we use. It makes these arms pop up and get all swollen. On days when the makeup doesn't turn out 100%, I just sneak by the camera and rub a little Vaseline on the lens, and then everything looks fine. <laughs> so don't tell the DP that. He gets really upset. <laughs> this was so funny. <laughs> During the production, Makeup artist Jeff Don and Steve Laporte and hairdresser Peter Tothball would transform Arnold into the flesh-covered Terminator an estimated 35 times, totaling six consecutive days in the makeup chair for Arnold. Not too much, because if you put too much blood on it, it uh, doesn't, you, you can't see the work that's been done. You can't see the metal and the flesh that's gone. It just looks like a big bloody mess, like you slap some hamburger on it. That's a good example, Jeff. Hamburger? I'm proud of it. Well, I'm hungry right now, so I should to use hamburger. <laughs> People accept this possibility that there can be a, a blend between a human component and a machine component. And I think it's just an aspect of our lives right now that we're so surrounded by machines all the time. And the fact that we can accept that, to me, is the most amazing thing of all. What it is is I'm too handsome. No camera can take all these good looks. So what they do in every movie, basically, is, is they put appliances on and terrible makeup on to kind of tone my looks down a little bit so I match up to the rest of the actors in the movie. <laughs> I, so I, tell me, Linda, what do you think? Uh, <laughs> I'm a little too pretty, too, for this movie, so... All right. Well! <laughs> Was my breath that bad? Two and a half, three hours, and he's done. The next stage for the makeup is stage five, six, seven. And it's basically the same that Arnold had before, just more chrome, more appliances. He'll have his eye plugged up, so he won't be able to see out of it. And uh, it'll take probably an hour, hour and a half longer to put on. He's going to love it. As one might imagine, Sarah has trouble accepting the Terminator as an ally. Although she doesn't know that he's going to come back, she knows that it's a possibility, so she's ready. No affection. You know, I, I've kept it really clean. Do you know what you're doing? I've detailed files on a human anatomy. I bet. Makes you a more efficient killer, right? Correct. Terminator in this film adopts certain human characteristics. you got to listen to the way people talk. And if someone comes off to you with an attitude, you say, Hasta la vista, baby. Hasta la vista, 
baby. That character slowly develops uh, by the very fact of hanging around a human being. Jesus, you were going to kill that guy. Of course, I'm a Terminator. Listen to me very carefully, okay? You're not a Terminator anymore, all right? And, and all that registers, and I start dealing with all those uh, kind of emotions. But the Terminator sent to kill young John is unlike any killing machine ever imagined. I call him a, a mimetic polyalloy, meaning that, it, that, that he's made of a substance that can imitate anything. Playing the T-1000 is Robert Patrick. Jim was looking for somebody that was sort of a mixture between the protector character, which was Michael Bean in the first, and Arnold Schwarzenegger, which was, uh, which is the Terminator. And I think he was looking for somebody that could look like he could possibly just be a human, and yet could be uh, a Terminator, could handle the intensity of being a Terminator. Well, I wanted to find someone who would be a good contrast to, to Arnold. If the 800 series is a kind of human hands or tank, then the 1000 series had to be a Porsche an advanced prototype Terminator who was uh, more fearsome than the old model. The thing I like about Robert was he, he kind of looks like a cat in a way. It's almost like it's about senses with him. You know, he, you feel that he's very in touch with the, with the world and analyzing it and observing it. My character wants to completely take out John Connor. That's his mission. A relentless tenacious killing machine, and he won't stop. Though their missions are exact opposites, both Terminators stem from the same creator, the unseen supercomputer called Skynet. So it's like this is the first time you've had to deal with evil, because right. Terminators don't fight Terminators. Right. It's never happened. We stem from the same technology, so we've got to have some like programming. Are you the legal guardian of John Connor? That's right, officer. What's he done now? So we're both killing machines. We're just different types. There was a guy here this morning looking for him, too. Yeah, a big guy on a bike. Has that got something to do with this? Yeah, the, the new Terminator, really, with his new capabilities, is, is, is much more threatening. Now I'm basically death. You know, they're running from death. Both Terminators are programmed to complete their missions at all costs and without question. But Sarah has decided to confront her destiny and takes matters into her own hands. I need to know how Skynet gets built. Who's responsible? The main most directly responsible is Miles Bennett Dyson. She decides that the only way to stop the future that she knows is going to happen is to kill the man that builds the chip that starts the war. In a very real way, she becomes the terminator of the, of the second film, at least at a kind of a psychological level. For cast and crew, Terminator 2 has been more than a reunion. It has been very intense to work, and uh, uh, you know, a lot of night shooting and a lot of long hours and so on. And I'm very honored and happy that I'm able to do the second one. In 1984, Cameron transformed Arnold into one of the screen's most memorable villains. Seven years later, the process is reversing itself. The Terminator is becoming a protector. Ultimately, the film is about the value of human life. No matter how inconsequential you may seem to others or even to yourself, your individual existence may have great value in the future. Baby, go! Go! They have a job to do, protect her son, and they do it. Terminator was heralded as the science fiction film of the decade. Seven years later, stars Arnold Schwarzenegger and Linda Hamilton and visionary director James Cameron have created one of the largest movies ever, the conclusion of the Terminator saga. For cast and crew, Terminator 2 was nothing short of destiny.
Hasta la vista, baby. This is BBC One. Now we join Sue Cameron in the Newsnight studio for an update on the European Summit. Good morning. In the past hour, European community leaders have reached agreement on political union. The social chapter, which had been the sticking point to the negotiations for Britain, has been dropped. The other 11 may hammer out a separate deal on social policy, but it'll be outside the Treaty of Rome. That means it won't apply to Britain, although number 10 has just been stressing that the UK will adopt any social pressures that it thinks would benefit British workers and British industry. Mr Major is expected to report back on what his officials are saying is an excellent solution to the Commons later this afternoon, providing he's back in time. Now over to Jeremy Paxman in Maastricht. Yes, within the uh, last hour, as you say, the arrangements on the social chapter, which had threatened to sink the negotiations here, have been struck out of the treaty. The summit is concluding. The British believe this is a major triumph because they have got rid at a stroke of the th element in the treaty to which they most objected. But the questions have already begun. What price, if any, did the British have to pay in terms of concessions elsewhere in the treaty? Is this another potential two-tier Europe? 